Hi everyone, my name is Monica Martinez and I'm gonna be sharing with you some basic design principles to help with slide design. Um, I'm gonna kick this off by really just showing you some examples of bad design and good design and then we'll jump in to uh, some different ideas. So I'm gonna exit out of my presentation here and I'm gonna show you that all I've done here is do a quick Google image search for bad slide design. By simply even just glancing at what's on the screen, we can definitely tell that, oh my gosh, this is definitely some bad design. And even without popping anything open, I can tell you right off the bat that it's just way too much text. It's way too text heavy. And the thing is, no one's gonna be able to read all of that text off of a slide, especially when on a, a big screen and it's not necessarily tangible in, in either a book or um, uh, in a format in which you know we might read like in a magazine. So already that tells us that there's just way too much going on, too much text, too much to read. Um, you can also see just by me scrolling here through some other things that there, there in some cases there's there's just a lot of extra elements on on each of these slides where there's just way too much and it's not going to allow us to be able to digest the information well. In contrast, I did a quick Google image search for good design, and this is what came up. And you can already see just between one and the other that this is a lot cleaner simpler, it has less stuff on each of these uh, different um, images, uh, the text is cleaner. So there's definitely a lot less going on. And in order to accomplish that, it's as simple as following some really um, basic design principles. So let's just go ahead and go back to the presentation and, uh, and jump back into those principles that I'm gonna share with you. Now, I do wanna point out that there are definitely a lot of design principles, but we're gonna focus on a few to get us started. So let's start with the rule of thirds. So in the rule of thirds, um, this allows us to draw attention and decide where on the canvas, where on your slide, you're gonna put your point of entry. And we're gonna unpack what those words mean here in just a second, but let's quickly start with with just the rule of thirds and talking about um, the actual grid. So when you look at your entire slide like we have here, um, of course we've got the picture on the left, we've got a quote on the right. What you're looking at doing is, is pretty much putting like a tic-tac-toe grid over your entire slide or over your image if, if what you're working with is just a single image. Now yes, we could crop this image down to make it better, um, and this already is an improvement, but what the rule of thirds is telling us is when we place the grid over your slider, over your image, it's giving us nine different positions where we can put your main focus or your main object, in this case being um, Albert Einstein. So we're gonna shift him over to the left. So we're gonna utilize these quadrants over here on the left-hand side to put our main subject. So here he is. Um, not only did I shift him over to the left, but I actually took advantage of my entire canvas, the entire slide, and I filled it with the actual image. Now this still leaves us room on the right-hand side to be able to add um, the quote or any text we might want to add. But you can see here that this is a lot better um, than our first two examples where we have the image. And then even with the crop down image, this is definitely improving uh, quite a bit. So by simply applying the rule of thirds, we were able to see um, the ability to be able to move uh, your main object to one part of your screen. Now I do want to point out there is a common mistake that people make. Um, if you have an image where somebody is either staring at something or pointing to something, it's important that you do not put that person uh, towards the edge of the screen like you see in this example. I see this happen a lot and what's interesting is that people will react in a way where it's like, mm, not, not a great slide, um, something you know maybe needs to be changed about this, but they can't always pinpoint it. Um, and in this case, it's really just the fact that he's staring off the screen and that visually doesn't make sense to us whether or not we understand that. So you never wanna put someone um, close to an edge if they're looking out in, in, uh, in that direction, or if somebody's pointing, you definitely don't want them pointing off the screen. So instead, if you apply the rule of thirds, we would place them on the right hand uh, quadrant so that he's looking towards something. So we have space of something that he's looking towards as opposed to being cut off uh, in the way that the previous image was. So this is a much better use of rule of thirds. 
Now, uh, in order for me to be able to accomplish what I did with uh, Albert Einstein in this picture, I did use a photo editing tool. If we go back to our original, which is this one here, he's a lot darker. Um, you can see sort of the difference between the, the background wall and then the, the base. Um, so I did several things to be able to come up with this. And to do that, um, I used an app called Snapseed. Now this is my go-to favorite um, app to use to edit photos, but I know that there are a ton out there. Definitely find the one that you like, that you're comfortable with. But I did wanna share just a couple of quick things with you uh, on this one in particular, as uh, it is my favorite because um, because of its, its um, basically its, its complexity, kind of like Photoshop, but yet simple enough for even the basic user who doesn't use Photoshop um, can use this and be able to accomplish great, great results. In addition, it's a mobile app. So as soon as I take a picture or capture my images, I can go directly in it, edit them, and then have them ready to go for my presentations. So I'm gonna give you a couple of quick examples. Um, we saw this one already in, in the slide deck that I'm sharing with you where we have Albert Einstein here on the left, where you know he's just you know the basic uh, picture. Not only did I crop it, I aligned them over to the left-hand side. I'm using the rule of thirds. And then I did a glow, and you can kind of see that glow right around the edges here. And then a vignette, which darkens my outside. And then I did a, um, I actually did a lens blur, even though there wasn't much going on here. I did a lens blur in order to bring more focus to him and less to our background, which was really just a white wall. Um, and then lastly, um, I did do a, a little bit of tweaking on his face. So I added more light to his face. I softened it up a little bit as well. Um, when I added light, uh, you can see a little more of the texture. And so I softened that uh, a little bit as well. So, so quite a few changes to be able to get um, this look over this one. I'm going to show you another example of the kinds of things that you can do using this app. So here is my cousin's little girl, and I think that this picture is already a good picture to begin with, but there are some elements that are bothering me about this picture. For example, the text up here at the top right next to her head, and then this part right here, it's really just a gap in the seat, but it looks like the picture is torn in, so I'm not really a fan of, of, of that there, that it's bugging me. And then, of course, we've got all these straps, so so there's, there's some elements that, that are definitely um, bothering me. So I took this into Snapseed, cropped it, and then got rid of some of those elements, like the text that was up here by her side, cleaned up the area so that that gap wasn't here in the seat. And because I cropped in this close, I was able to get rid of one of those straps. And now I've, I've only got one left, and, and I went ahead and, and, and just left that as is. The other thing that I did, you can notice on the picture itself, I added an effect called Glamour Glow. And this gave it that touched up magazine look, um, which, uh, which really just softened it and brightened, um, brightened up certain areas to make her just kind of really stand out and glow. And so this looks more professionally done. And that's exactly what Snapseed's gonna help you accomplish. I'm gonna share with you one more. Got several on here, but I'm gonna do one more. Okay. So this is at a dance competition that uh, my niece was involved in um, not too long ago. And as most dance competitions, um, they end up doing these in gyms, in school gyms or auditoriums. And as you can see here, we are in a gym. Um, and you've got bleachers in the back, you've got people, and they're in a, on a basketball court. So there's all kinds of stuff that, um, that definitely don't make for a good photograph, right? Like this is a typical snapshot. So using Snapseed, um, I used a tool called the brush, which allowed me to, not a paint bucket by any means, but allowed me to basically overexpose the image in certain parts to be able to get rid of um, some things. So here's my original, and using Snapseed with several different elements, I got this as my end result. So again, Snapseed is my go-to app. Um, which is available for iOS and Android because it is easy to use. It has a lot of sophisticated features like you would get in Photoshop, um, except they're really simple um, to be able to apply and use on your on your images, and, uh, and it's right there in the palm of your hand. So take the shot, and then you can edit right away. So that is my go-to. Now, there are definitely other apps that are available. Like I said, I'm sure a lot of you probably have your go-to favorites. 
Um, so definitely um, tap into one you're comfortable with so you can have one ready to go to use to, to adjust your photos as needed. I do want to point out one other um, tool uh, before we go on to the next design principle, and that's going to be auto draw. And the reason why I mention this is because sometimes it's not about bringing in an image, but instead you're looking for graphics. Now, there are a lot of tools out there for graphics, and of course, you can go onto the web and do a search for graphics. For those of you who might be looking to create your own graphics, um, I like auto draw because even for the person who is not a designer uh, or can't do graphics, for example, um, this is going to be a really great one for you. So the idea is that you just basically draw whatever it is that you're trying to draw, however good or bad it is. And as you can see, I'm doing a pretty terrible job here. I'm trying to use my my um, touchpad on on the on my computer, on my laptop, without having my uh, pencil drawing tool. So not doing a very good job. Um, but as you saw, um, as I was drawing my son, which is what I intended to draw here, a son, up at the top, it's starting to recognize different shapes based off of what I've drawn. And as you can see, it gave me a couple of different sons to choose from. So if I just simply click on one of those, it'll clean up my, uh, my graphic and make it look a lot more uh, professional. So I'm just going to go go ahead and come and select it and just make it smaller and move it over. So you can continue to draw um, as as you want. I mean, that could be the only graphic you needed, or perhaps you're drawing trying to draw an entire um, slide. And so you could continue to draw um, and create your entire scene. <laughs> this is a very terrible looking um, boat, but there you have it. So. You continue to go, and as you're drawing, it starts giving you uh, the different options um, that that you get based on what you're drawing. So from here, we're basically going to the three little lines up at the top um, left, and then we click on download, and it's going to download a an image of what you've just created, a PNG, which you can always come back to on your um, slide deck, and then be able to bring those in from um, your downloads. So for mine. Uh, I'm just going to select this one that I already had. You just bring it right in, uh, drop it in, and then you size it accordingly. Um, you do what you need to do with it. Um, and if you need it to crop down, it's a simple double click, as you all probably know, and then just uh, crop it down to the section you need, and then move it and place it wherever um, you would like to place that object. Now, you'll notice that um, these objects do come with a white background, so I have to arrange this, as you saw me do there, into an order. So I just I just place this in the back so that this graphic could sit on top of this one. Um, and that allows me to stack things even when there is a, uh, a white box around uh, that particular object. I recommend cropping down your image uh, really well so that it's as close as possible um, to that particular graphic, and that's going to help you uh, eliminate from white boxes bumping into other white boxes, which is which is nice. All right, so let's go back into this presentation. Um, so that was the rule of thirds. Rule of thirds helps you with layout and 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 moving things around your page. Next, we're going to talk about fonts. Now, I know we all love fonts. We all love to use our fonts, but we should definitely be conscious about how many fonts we're picking uh, and when we're using what types of fonts. In other words, we're looking at purpose. So let's talk through that a little bit. So here's our image, which is already better, right, on our slide. But as with the bad examples that I showed you earlier, there's just way too much going on in this particular slide. And that has a lot to do with all of this text. Now you see a lot going on from different fonts to also different colors, so different things going on here. Well, let's talk fonts first, um, and let's talk families, families of fonts. So for, for example, where it says questioning, when I look at this font, it reminds me of Halloween. And Halloween, or scary things, have nothing to do with the message that um, Albert Einstein is saying here. So this font has no purpose here. And that's one thing you need to decide is, is if, if the font is going to help you tell that story or if the font really is just meant to be something that's legible to make a point. And so you have to be really careful when selecting your fonts. Obviously, questioning, the font we use for questioning doesn't belong here. Same thing for the font that's being used for um, uh, existing, right? Like this has no business being in, in here. 
Now, the other thing I want to point out is that there are some fonts that will come like this one here that are italicized. And one of the biggest things here that's the issue is um, the spacing between the letters. It's way too close to each other, making it a little hard to read. Um, had, had this been the entire quote in this font, it would have been that much harder to read the whole thing here. All right, so that's one thing to consider. The other, let's talk a little bit about caps. Okay, so you see a lot of words in here in caps. When you capitalize uh, just a few words or a single word, it's it's probably okay. But when you start doing longer things like an entire quote or you know um, phrases, then it's probably not a good idea. For starters, you probably know this, but when people write things in caps, it's in regards to sort of uh, a netiquette. It means that somebody's yelling at you, right? Um, but more than that, when people are reading text on a screen and it's all in caps, it makes it harder to read. We actually read slower if it's all in caps. And the reason being is because there is no difference between the X height of each of the tops of your letters. When you see the words uh, up here at the top, the important thing is there is a difference in the height of each of those letters um, in this particular font. But when you do all caps, there isn't. It's, it's basically flat up at the top. And so it slows us down because we have to look at every single letter to put that word together versus when we see words put together like this, like the word important, where you have lowercase where there's there's a, a, an in, a sort of an, uh, a difference between the height of the I and then the M and so forth. And then the shape uh, is shaped to that particular letter, it helps us read faster. We don't have to look at every every letter to read the entire sentence. So that's one thing to really consider. All right, so let's say that uh, that we've improved this, right? Like we start changing up the text so that that there's more um, consistency, right? There was just way too many too too many fonts, and then we also had things with caps and so forth. So let's let's talk a little bit about spacing. Uh, because we looked at this in uh, the font here where it's not to stop. Like some fonts will have the spacing really close together and others will have it really, really far apart, separated, just like you see here. So let's talk about spacing here. There are times where um, where the spacing will automatically be generated in a certain way because of the font. And then there are other times where the designer can choose to make the spacing between letters a certain way on purpose. So if you look at this this logo, the FedEx logo, um, in this case, the letters were butted up against each other on purpose uh, because FedEx wanted you to maybe not really see, but wanted you to maybe subconsciously or in a subliminal way um, uh, be able to identify the white space between the E and the X, which actually forms um, it forms an arrow. So here it is. Um, here's the arrow between the E and the X. Now this is using your white space, your negative space. So this is all a part of the canvas um, back here. And just by butting up those two letters, it creates the illusion of an arrow. So let me go back here. I just want to point out. So the concept of adjusting the spacing between your uh, different characters is called kerning. And so usually a designer would add more kerning to this, but here it's done on purpose to not have uh, the additional space because we wanted to create an arrow to give you sort of this idea that FedEx is going to guarantee to ship your, your stuff to where it needs to go, right? And so it's all about creating uh, a feeling, an emotion that you're now attaching to this logo or to this company um, that you're trusting to ship your, your stuff. However, like I said earlier, some fonts already naturally come in a certain way and you don't have a lot of choices in making adjustments because typically in, in uh, slide presentation software, you don't have text editing capabilities to adjust things like uh, we just talked about, kerning. And so what you'll end up with instead is something like this, where you're like, oh, I'm liking this font, but unfortunately you can't space out your letters. Um, and so, so you end up having words that come together in a way um, that don't look like what they're supposed to say, um, like you see here. Obviously, it's supposed to say flickering lights, but it looks like it says something else. So be really careful when choosing your fonts. Now, having said all of that, I hope that you'll consider those things when choosing fonts. But I did want to share with you a tool 
um, that uh, that I really like that works really great uh, called fonts.google.com. Um, it works really great for you to be able to um, select the fonts that you want to use that help you either tell your story better because of the style of the font or, of course, make it uh, uh, legible and readable, right? So when you come here, when you get into um, the directory, you'll notice that uh, each of the fonts that are listed there um, have a bit of text to show you what that font would look like. Um, you can, um, up here, there's some drop-down menus where you can change it to show just like the alphabet or paragraph of text so you can get a better feel for it. Up here at the top, there's a little plus sign. So once you decide, I like this font, you simply click on that little plus sign right up here. And notice it popped up this uh, dark gray bar down at the bottom right. And I'm just going to go ahead and click on it there so you can see that a little bit better. Um, so what you've done is, is you've basically selected this font. This font, uh, Roboto, that I selected is now available in my Google Slide Deck if you happen to be using Google Slides. If you're using something else like Microsoft PowerPoint or other software that's on your computer, you do actually have the option to download this. So you see there's a little download arrow right up here at the top right-hand side. You click on that, it'll download this to your computer, and then all you have to do is add this to your font library on your computer's hard drive, and then that font becomes available on uh, all of your programs that you have installed on your computer. But for anything on Google Sites, by simply clicking the plus sign there, it will become available in your Google uh, uh, presentation, your uh, Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Forms, etc. So it becomes available for you to be able to use. All right, so let's go back. Um, that was a little bit on fonts. Hopefully, um, hopefully you you got some ideas around uh, minimizing the use of fonts. And and really, I would recommend that you use no more than two fonts um, in your slide presentation. Keep them consistent. Be aware of font families. When you bold something, that's like a different font. Don't think that, oh, I'm using Helvetica, light, bold, and medium, but it's just one font. That's when it starts getting sort of complicated and messy and, and just where there's just too much stuff on your slide. So keep it simple, minimize it to maybe two fonts throughout your entire presentation. And remember that those include uh, fonts within the family. Now, I did want to point out um, uh, there's uh, this designer, uh, Nancy Duarte, um, where she talks about um, really looking at your slides as if they were billboards. And so I do, I do want to point out that, that your slides should be as simple as possible so that people can understand what's on your slide. And Nancy Duarte references this as, as billboards in the sense that when you're driving down a highway and you glance over at a billboard, you should be able to read and understand what they're trying to tell you in three seconds or less. Because after three seconds, you're gone. You can no longer even see that billboard anymore, right? Because you're on an expressway and you're moving fairly quickly. She says that we should think of our slides in the same way in that if I don't understand what's on there in three seconds or less, then it's pr probably too complex. So if you think of it that way, have somebody um, take a look at your slides, set it on a timer so that it advances from one slide to the next in th every three seconds and see if people understood your message or if they were lost on any one of those slides. And that's going to be a good indicator of um, the need to have to change the content. All right, let's move on to our next um, design principle, which is creating contrast. Contrast is so important as it drives the eye, helps us tell our story across um, um, all of our slides as well as our images and graphics that we use. So um, I want to talk a little bit of, about contrast in, in, in different ways, one of which is going to be contrast in different elements that are on your page. For example, here, the word existing doesn't have enough contrast between the word and the background color. Right, so the color of the word is like a, a grayish, but it's got a fade, and so there are parts of it that I cannot see. Same thing with the background, right? There's there's also sort of a gradient uh, in the background, so it's not allowing me to see the E, X, and I very well. Um, then it's important to know things like which colors go well together. 
and a lilac up against a gray does not go well together. It, it doesn't have um, the right amount of contrast between the two. Um, and so it just sort of creates this, this color um, in, the, in the lilac one that just kind of almost hurts my eyes to look at it. So you have to be really careful with how you pair up your colors. The other thing too, and that I see a lot is where we sort of missed it where it came to these two colors here. Like they're close together, but there's not enough contrast between the two different colors to be able to really set those two apart. In other words, they're too close together uh, in, in shade. And so it just doesn't work well here, right? So those are things to consider when it comes to your colors. Um, and I want to point out that even in the professional field, people make mistakes when it comes to this. Um, I was at a Hilton hotel and um, I was looking through um, their, di their directory and their catalogs. And I came across the series of pages that for starters was on a textured paper, which is already going to be hard to read. But then on top of that, they, they for some reason, um, picked this particular blue and they insisted on using it on all of their stuff everywhere. And it just didn't make for, for good enough contrast to be able to read. And so I had a really hard time reading this and, and I lightened this up a little bit just so that you could at least see that the text was blue. It was that much harder to actually be able to read this when, when I had the paper in front of me. So even the professionals make those mistakes. So remember to create enough contrast between the different elements on the page. Contrast also creates a point of entry. And what I mean by this is that um, the contrast in, in the elements themselves between your image and your main focus, Albert Einstein in this case, and your text, um, those are two different elements on your page. But right now, there's no real contrast. Everything is sort of competing for the real estate. Our eye doesn't go in any one direction. It's kind of trying to, to take everything in all at once, and it's overwhelming. And it's overwhelming because you have color, you have different fonts, and you, then you have this big picture, too many competing elements. So what we need to do is strip down the parts that aren't as important and create a hierarchy. So if we wanted to see Albert Einstein first, then we, we need to strip the color. And by simply stripping the color, that already helps. But because the text is so big and bold, they're still competing, right? It's better, but it's not quite there yet. So another thing you can do is adjust your fonts, clean it up, and then adjust the size. You know, what parts of this don't need to be as big as they are, right? And remember, we want to focus on Albert Einstein first. So let's strip it down a little bit further. And now what you have when you come to this slide, you see him first. Second, you'd probably see the word curiosity, and you can see it's a little bit bolder and darker, and then you'd see the rest of the quote. And this is creating contrast with your elements, right, by simply adjusting them in order to create point of entry. So let's go back. So this was the first one, right? Like here there was no real point of entry. My eye didn't know where to go. But by stripping down the colors and the font and the size, we were able to create a hierarchy. You see Albert first, Curiosity second, and the rest of the, the text third. Now, if you were trying to do the opposite and we want the text and the word Curiosity to stand out first and then the rest of the text and then Albert Einstein, then you could actually adjust the image so that it didn't stand out as much as it did. And so you can actually make it a lot lighter. So I'm going to get out of my presentation here. I'm going to show you really quick. Inside of Google Slides, um, you can actually go into the format options of an image. So when you select an image and click on format options, it allows you to adjust the image. And so you have transparency, brightness, and contrast. And so you can eliminate contrast or add more. You can add brightness or decrease brightness. So um, it's completely up to you which route you want to go. And so we can get darker and darker and darker, kind of something like this. See where he stands out less. At this point, I would probably change this um, text here. Instead of uh, that red, it doesn't quite pop. I would make it white to help it pop. And I would even change the font. That's, that font's just not easy to read. So you might want to choose a different font and, and then have it just really uh, kind of like pop, you know, a, a font that would help. Uh, help that text really pop. Um, so this is already looking a little bit better. Um, but there's definitely still more things that you can do here with, with your fonts. But 
But by simply changing the opacity uh, and adjusting, adjusting the contrast and brightness of your image, we've already helped the word curiosity pop out a lot more. So let's just take this back into presentation mode here. So see here, this in relation to this one, here Albert Einstein is the first thing you see versus here, the word curiosity is the first thing I see. Um, and so by changing up colors, size, fonts, the, the brightness and, and contrast of an image, you can see you can play around with all of these elements to draw the eye where you wanna draw the eye. And this is important, why? Well, because remember you're telling a story and you want people to focus on the most important parts of your story. And what you have on your slide is gonna help you do that. Here are some examples of how text and image can work together. Um, the important thing to remember in, in, in these cases is to use both elements to help you tell that story. And in this case, you can see like just, you know, the image itself along with what the text says really tie in together. Um, and so that's, that's the way to, to really, um, achieve that. Because we were talking about colors, I did want to share with you uh, a Chrome extension that I really like called Palette Creator that help a lot because um, it, when you're trying to combine colors together, um, a Palette Creator uh, would help you be able to generate colors off of an image. So if you already had an image that had the colors that you liked, or perhaps you did a, a Google image search and found some colors that you're like, oh, these would be great. like. This really helps tell the story I'm trying to tell because the color orange is all about energy and movement and what have you. And so let's say we did this search for flowers here and I came across these orange colors and those that's kind of sort of the color scheme that I wanna use. Then with the extension uh, palette creator, I'm simply gonna right click and, and ask it um, to have it create a palette of, and then you can see you have several options. Let's just do 32 colors. And so it goes and it generates 32 different colors based off of that image. So let's say from these colors, I was like, oh, I'm really digging this, this like sort of dark orange. I'm gonna take that hex value. I'm simply highlighting and copying the hex value of that color. And I'm gonna come back to my, um, my, my presentation here. And we're going to take that word curiosity and we're gonna go give it that color. So I'm gonna go into custom, and right up here at the top in this box is where you can drop in that hex value. It'll find that color for you. You click okay, and now you have that color in your presentation. And not only is it available here for this letter, but notice, or this word, but notice it is now available under all of your custom colors. So now this color is here so that I can use it in the rest of this presentation. Um, and so that it becomes a part of the theme of, of, my, uh, of my slides. So that's the tool called Palette Creator. Um, again, it's a Chrome extension, highly recommended, especially if, um, if you're trying to create a color scheme that goes well with your message and you're not sure which colors go well together, this is definitely gonna help you uh, accomplish that. So I wanted to share this quote with you um, because what we've been looking at so far is obviously some imagery. Um, and, and this is really why I focus my energy on imagery is because imagery can help you tell a story uh, quite well. And not only that, but it becomes that much more memorable. And so it's important to know that just by simply adding an image to your presentation, you're already gonna make your presentation that much better for your end user. So I wanna wrap up with this. Um, you got some design principles here, you got some ideas, but it's important to get the right images. It's important to get the right fonts. It's important to, to work with the right media to begin with. When I was in, in, uh, in school studying design, um, they made us go through this process where we had, to, um, we had to do a lot of brainstorming and thinking before we even started looking at images and, and, and going out and doing photo shoots or, or, or going to the computer and designing graphics. And it was, it was basically broken down into several steps, and I've, I've, I've mashed it up into six. So the first thing is to know what your topic is. What's your presentation about? What is your message about? Then what you do is you just simply jot down all kinds of words about that particular message or that topic. 
then what you want to do is you share your message and your topic or the idea of your message and your topic with a friend. Share it with somebody else. Ask them to jot down as many words as they can think of in relation to that topic. Then what you do is you compare both lists. You compare yours to the list of, of, of your friend or your colleague, and you identify common words between both of them. What are those common themes amongst these different um, uh, pages of words that you've collected? Once you have the common themes, now you've identified what your story is, right? It should connect to your story, and that's your media. Those are the kinds of images and graphics that you should be aiming to get. That's the kind of font you should be aim aiming to have as well. And if it doesn't match your story, if you go back and you realize, oh, wow, like that's not really what this story is about or that's not my message, then, then it's a matter of, of re, like just kind of going back and, and rethinking uh, what parts of your message aren't conveying what you thought they were conveying, right? And so it just kind of goes back to step number one, pretty much. But just by following these simple steps, it helps you identify the kinds of images that you, be, you should be selecting, the types of graphics that you should be using. Even things like fonts um, become evident because it helps us either stick to just being legible um, and, and using type to just be something that people can read, or even finding text that's gonna help you tell that story a little bit better. All right, so I, I did also want to share with you, um, there's an artist here um, who's, who lived here in my hometown of Austin, Texas, um, and his name is Austin Cleon. Um, he wrote this book called Steal Like an Artist, and uh, over here on the right-hand side, this is actually what I wanted to share with you from, uh, from what I read in his book that I really liked. Um, the way in which we learn and grow and, and become better designers uh, of, you know, with our presentations is is by well what he would call you know stealing like an artist in that that we have to visually help ourselves to to be able to envision things and to do that is exactly um, what I did for you guys here where you simply do a Google search for good design and you start to basically study that like why is that good oh because it's one font oh because you know look at the colors they go they match really well together oh look i like how they use this brown against this yellow etc you study good design to be able to come up with good design yourself and so by simply looking at that um, you're helping train your eye in 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 what looks good and what doesn't look good and, uh, and so Austin Kleon refers to this sort of as like stealing like an artist, right? We're mentally uh, learning. It's not stealing as in like we're not giving credit to those that, that are due credit for, for the work that we're using in our slides, but instead borrowing from uh, what makes it visually great. So I want to close with this quote by Oliver Wendell Holmes because I feel like whenever we do get exposed to good design, um, we can just never go back to to bad design like it's it's not something that we're capable of doing anymore because now we know now we know how to make things look great and beautiful and aesthetically pleasing and i hope that this presentation has inspired you to tackle uh your presentations into uh looking better and and being as great as they can be and helping you tell your story thank you <laughs>